Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today's video is gonna be a little bit different. Uh, usually I do beauty and lifestyle, like vlogs and stuff like that. But today I'm gonna be talking about houses and buying houses. Um, and that is very not typical of my content. So a year ago today, Thomas and I closed on our house. And so I thought it would be appropriate to tell you what it was like being a first time home buyer in a seller's market. Um, it is still very much a seller's market right now. I know that it's kind of going up and down and whatnot. But as of today, when I'm looking at it, it is very much a seller's market. I've done a lot of research. We have lots of notes to go through. I'm gonna link my notes in the description box so you can reference them if you are looking for a home right now, whether you're a first time home buyer or you have never bought a house in a seller's market, I'm going to do my best to be of assistance. Keep in mind, I'm not a real estate agent. I'm not a mortgage person. I don't know anything of the ins and outs of that in terms of like, in firsthand experience. I just know what it was like being a first time home buyer in a seller's market. It was very interesting and I'm going to share my tips, tricks, and lessons that I learned during that time and just as well as my experience. So let's get into it. So like I said, we bought our house in a seller's market. It is still very much a strong seller's market right now in the United States. This has altered a little bit because there has been an increase in real estate listings, but these changes have not been enough to shift the market from sellers to a buyer's market. Um, maybe that'll come in the future, but it's not the case at the moment. From what it looks like, it's probably not gonna change anytime soon. Just a little <laughs> disclaimer, I would not suggest buying a house in a seller's market if you can avoid it. Thomas and I really didn't have much of a choice. Luckily for us, we bought it at the beginning of the seller's market and we ended up closing on this beautiful house, which was sold by people who really needed to get out of the house quickly. Uh, because they had some life changes that were happening at a rapid pace. So they needed to, to get out of the house quickly. And so they weren't trying to haggle us. They weren't trying to take us for all of what we were worth. And so that was really great. Um, we were very blessed in that way, but we did encounter other sellers on other houses that we offered on prior to getting this house that did try to take us for all the money that we were worth. <laughs> if you can avoid buying a house in a seller's market, I would. But if you were like my husband and I a year ago and you needed, you need to buy a house because you're living with family or you need to get out of an apartment lease or something like that, then I will help you to the best of my ability with all of the tips and stuff that I learned during the process of us getting our house. So before this house, we offered on three different houses. Um, we of course lost out on all of them as we did not get them. And there are a variety of reasons why we went up against a lot of real estate investment companies when it came to putting our offer on the table. These are companies who are specifically out to buy, flip and rent houses. Um, so they can offer an obscene amount of money above what the asking price is. And one thing you should know about the seller's market is 95% of the time, this is just a very rough guesstimate, you're going to have to over offer on a house in order to even be considered to be picked to buy the house. But the problem is when you go up against a real estate investment company, they can offer like something ridiculous, like $500,000 for a $250,000 house. And of course automatically win because the seller is going to want to get the most money. Another thing that happened when we lost against like other offers was people taking out their appraisal contingency clauses. If you don't know what this is, an appraisal contingency clause is a provision included in purchase contracts that allows home buyers to back out of their contract if a home is appraised for less than the purchase price included in the contract. When you put an offer in on the house and your offer is accepted, the house is going to go through an appraisal. And this is basically saying what the house is actually worth. So what the appraisal contingency clause states is that the appraisal must meet or exceed the sales price. So the seller will only have an issue if the property appraises under the contract price. If the appraisal does come back under contract value, then the buyer and seller will have to negotiate to see who will cover the difference in the loan offered by the bank. What this means is that your bank, when you apply for a mortgage and you're like fully approved, not just pre-approved, but you're fully approved and you're clear to close basically, which we're gonna get to, once you're fully approved for a loan, you have that set amount to borrow from the bank to go towards your house. So if the house appraises for less than what you offered on the house, you're gonna have to cover the difference. Either you or the seller, and it's usually the buyer, especially in a seller's market, 
let's say you you see a house that you like, it's 250, okay? That's a pretty median price right now for the market. Let's say you offer 275 and the house appraises for 260. That means that you're gonna have to come up with $15,000 out of your own pocket, not including what you're already gonna have to pay in closing fees and earnest money, which is a part of closing fees, by the way. So you're gonna have to come with that out of pocket because the bank is not gonna cover that for you. So a lot of people that we went up against and ultimately lost to when we offered on a house would take out this appraisal contingency clause, which would then say that if the house appraises less than what the house is going to be sold for, the seller or the buyer is gonna have to cover that difference. And typically, like I said, in a seller's market, it will be the buyer. And a lot of times you're gonna have to back out because you know, people may not have $15,000 laying around or maybe you don't wanna spend that out of pocket because maybe it's just not worth it. Don't take out your appraisal contingency clause. We're gonna get into tips and tricks here in a second, but I'm just kind of giving a backstory of, you know, my experience overall. Another reason that we lost out was we were a backup offer on a house, very cute house, and we were pretty much guaranteed to get this house because the original offer was contingent on the buyer who offered initially on selling their house. So they hadn't sold their house about a week before closing, and it's a very slim chance that they'd be able to sell their house within a week and get to closing on this other house. Especially since closing is at least 28 days long, sometimes it's like as long as three months and so on and so forth. So we offered this backup offer, we were sure we were gonna get this house, it was a really cute house, not as cute as the one that we're in now, but it was really cute. The seller's real estate agent was like, you're gonna get it, don't even worry about it. Then we find out the next day after we put in our backup offer that somebody had come in with a way higher offer price than we had given and uh, they got picked over us. So basically that was just bad luck, but it ended up working in the end because we got a much cuter house in a neighborhood that I like a little bit better than that other one. And I think Thomas does too. And then the last reason we lost out on one of our other offers to the multiple other houses that we offered on was that we were just plain outbid. Yeah, we would over offer because that's what you kind of have to do in a seller's market, which is ridiculous, I know, but it's just, it's just how the market is when it's a seller's market. A lot of people were overbidding for like 50 to $75,000 over the asking price and we just could not afford that. We had gotten approved for a certain amount. We were trying to stay under budget of that amount and we just didn't want to risk it. And so the only time we over offered any higher than like five to $10,000 was actually on this house. We offered um, 275 and the asking price was 255. But that's still $20,000 over. And our house actually ended up appraising for $10,000 under the offer price, which means that we have $10,000 in home equity, which is amazing. You definitely wanna go for that. You at least want your appraisal to meet the offer price and the asking price. But if anything, if it appraises lower, then that means that you ha already have made that amount in home equity. So I did want to talk about the lessons I learned and some tips I have for those of you who may be first time home buyers in the very raging seller's market right now. So the first thing I really want to talk about is before you even start to look at houses, have your closing cost money set aside. Our closing cost money was about $6,000 um, in total. Get this money ready before you even start looking at houses. At least start getting the funds going uh, because you're not gonna wanna be slammed with a bunch of closing costs and be house broke. That's one way you can be house broke. There are other ways you can be house broke, which we're also gonna touch on. But um, you definitely wanna have your closing costs. For our house, we bought our house for $275 and um, our closing costs were about $6,000. The sellers covered 2,000 of that. And our earnest money, which is the money that's kind of like, I'm good for it money is how I'm putting it in quotes. Um, that's just basically to prove that you are good for your money and you will be able to close everything. A lot of people are doing it right now because the seller's market is so highly competitive. Um, so our earnest money was then $2,000 and then our remainder of the closing costs at the end were about $2,000 as well. So our house is about 1,600 square feet. It's a three bedroom, two bath. If you're gonna get a house this size, at least have like $6,000 saved. Of course, you're gonna need more money saved up if you're going for a bigger house with more square footage. So just make sure you're being smart about it. Another main thing that I suggest is don't get emotionally attached to a place at all. So that's something I learned really quickly. I am somebody who 
I can easily start picturing like happy moments in a house. And so when Thomas and I first started looking and we put an offer on our first house, we were sure we were gonna get that house. It was actually in the same neighborhood, but it's smaller um, and it's cute, but it, it I like ours a lot better. But um, we were sure we were gonna get it and we didn't because we lost out to a real estate investment company and I had already like started creating these memories that we may have in the future in this house in my mind. And so when we lost out on the offer, I was like so depressed, <laughs> not for very long, but it taught me right away, don't get emotionally attached, especially in a seller's market where you are going up against so many other offers that you basically just need to keep a level head about it. Uh, when we got to this house, this was my favorite one that we had ever seen. The real estate agent sent me a link and she was like, you're going to love this house. I did. We viewed it. I was like, I'm in love with this house. But we almost didn't even offer on this house. We almost offered on another house in the same neighborhood. This neighborhood is really hot right now, by the way, in my area. When we saw this house, I knew I loved it, but I didn't want to get emotionally attached. So I didn't like, I just thought, I didn't let myself think about any potential memories. We actually ended up offering on this house because the real estate agent of the sellers was like, nobody's offering because she took it like off of open house viewings really quickly. And so not a lot of people got to even see it. So it was between us and like eight other people, which is a lot, um, but not as many as we had gone up against before in our offers of like other houses that we had offered on. The reason we didn't offer on this house is because we didn't think we would have any chance of getting it. And so we had kind of just like moved on and it ended up just working out perfectly. It was very serendipitous. Um, but yeah, just don't get emotionally attached. It's so easy to get emotionally attached because you're gonna start picturing yourself in houses and like, you're gonna be like, it's so perfect, but don't do that. Be realistic about it. Be level-headed. You can love a house, but try not to get emotionally attached until you are at the closing table, until you are on your closing day, signing papers, and the house is then yours. That's kind of what my suggestion is. Don't get too hyped up about it before then. So another lesson I learned, as well as a, a tip I have for you guys, is don't overbid just to overbid to win a house. It is a competition and you don't want to overbid so far above your budget just because you're getting all wrapped up in the competition you really want this house or whatever don't get too into it make sure like the emotionally attached thing don't get too invested in it just to be smart and level-headed about it because you could easily get yourself in trouble if your offer was accepted because you overbid you know seventy five thousand dollars you could lose out on that house because you may not have the funds for it because all of a sudden you're gonna have to make up for that $75,000. Even if the house is appraised at that, you know, that's still gonna become a part of your monthly mortgage. Remember that when you're going in and offering on houses, you've most likely only been pre-approved and being pre-approved does not guarantee that that loan that you've been pre-approved for is yours. You have to be reevaluated again before you are clear to close and clear to close means that you've met the requirements and the conditions to close on your mortgage and underwriter goes through and runs your credit. Your credit's going to be run twice, most likely, sometimes more throughout the process. It'll get run first before you get pre-approved and then again before you close on a house. And, you know, just make sure that you don't go over the amount that is tentatively set for you by your mortgage loan officer. So let's say if you get approved for 285, don't go bid on a house that's worth $300,000 because you may not be cleared to close on it. So just be smart, please. But I'm just gonna keep saying that throughout the video. Just be smart, be level-headed, be logical. Also keep in mind when you're pre-approved for a home loan or you know if you're fully approved for it, keep in mind that your mortgage loan officer is not looking at certain bills. It's not looking at your phone bill, how much that costs. It's not looking at your power bill. It's not looking at your water bill. It's not looking at the amount that you spend on groceries a month. It's not looking at that. It's looking at basically how much you make a month, you know, your credit score and just how much student loan debt you have. So it's kind of just like touching the surface. So there could be somebody out there, like my, my parents-in-law, for example, Thomas's parents were in like the early 2000s, they were pre-approved for a $550,000 house, I think is what the price was. It was right around there. They had three kids. That was not going to work for them because they were gonna be house broke because if they had gotten a house that was worth that much, they would have had a great house, but they wouldn't have had money for groceries, phone bills, water bills. So 
just be smart about it. I would also suggest maybe trying to stay under your budget that the mortgage loan officer gives you. So like if you're, you know, our loan was approved for $300,000. We got a house that was 275 appraised for 265. So we're, we weren't house broke, which is really important because you don't wanna have a brand new house that's so cute and amazing, but you literally have no money to buy groceries and you know, basically do daily living things that you need to do. Very, very big tip, do not waive any clauses. This includes your inspection, your appraisal, your title contingency clauses. And just in case you're wondering, because I haven't touched on it yet, a title contingency is standard in most purchase and sale contracts, and it states that the seller must own the title free and clear in order to transfer it to the buyer. So it needs to have a clean title, just like if you buy a car, you don't want it to have a really messed up title because it's gonna make it hard for you to put the title on your car. It may mean that the, the car was in an accident that has not been reported. You know, you just want to make sure everything is clean on the house. Don't take out the appraisal. That is so stupid and it can get you in such hot water. It's not worth it to win a bid on a house because then you most likely as a buyer will have to cover it, especially in the seller's market. And then lastly, don't take out your inspection contingency clause because that's like the name implies, that means that somebody's gonna come in and make sure that you don't have like asbestos or you don't have rotting problems or termites you want to make sure your house is good to go. The only exception to taking out your inspection clause is if you have somebody that you know in your family or a friend that actually does this for a living, then maybe you can waive it. That's the only that's the only exception is that if you have somebody who basically does that for a living, you know, you could also save money in that as well because, you know, getting an inspection costs money. And you could probably save money if you know a personal friend who does it or somebody in your family who does it or whatever. But other than that, don't take out any of the contingency clauses. They are there for everybody's benefit, especially the buyers. So another thing I would advise you to do is to look out for little things in houses that may annoy you. So when you're viewing houses, you may notice little things that you don't like. And you might go in because you're so optimistic as a first time home buyer and be like, I can live with that, but maybe you can't. Let's say that one of the bedrooms is emerald green. I don't know where that came from, but let's say it's this dark emerald green and you're like, we can just paint over that. And then you start realizing that maybe you need to hire somebody to paint it and you, can, you don't have the money for it yet or you don't have the time for it yet. And then all of a sudden that room becomes your least favorite part of the house because you hate the paint color and you've bought this house and it's little, it's a little thing and it's easily fixed. But you know, if that's something that you cannot easily fix yourself, then make sure you make a note of that. You know, can I actually live with this green paint color? Or is it, is it a make or break for me? Another thing within this same idea is don't ignore certain parts of the house structurally that you don't like. So for example, Thomas and I love open concept. It's just what we like. It makes our house seem bigger. Our house is not huge or anything like that. So we like the fact that we have high ceilings and we it's very open feeling. So if you go into a house and it's very closed off and you're like, it's fine, like we can blow out this wall or we can hire somebody to do that. Um, that's not super easy to fix, you know? Like, it seems like it would be, but it costs money. The wall that you may want to knock out may be a low-bearing wall, which means that it is literally holding the house up and you can't take it down. So basically, don't ignore the little things. Make sure that you can live with that thing long enough, like a year, year and a half, give yourself a time, and think about it in your head and be like, could I live with blah, blah, blah this long, a year and a half long, whatever, before it gets fixed or is it gonna drive me crazy? Just make sure you're being logical. Like I said, be smart, be logical with everything. This is a business transaction. As exciting as it is, it's still a business transaction and it's very important for you to go into it knowing that and treating it as such. So one thing I want to bring up that nobody really told us about until later on, maybe it was a little bit too late to be honest when we found out about it, is that there is going to be a gap, of course, between your offer exception by the seller and your actual closing date, and a lot goes on between this. So you may be thinking, we just closed on this house, it's really exciting, I'm so excited, let's go buy a bunch of furniture. So earlier I mentioned that your credit is gonna be run at least twice, one before the pre-approval process, or one during the pre-approval process before you get pre-approved, 
and one right before you are officially cleared to close. So one thing you need to note is, of course, your credit needs to be in at least good standing, okay? But let's say your offer has been accepted on a house and you got 28 days or whatever, how, however long it is before you close and you decide, oh, I wanna go get a bunch of furniture. Um, we need couches and we need a bed and blah, 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 blah. You know, you need all this stuff. And let's say you put all of this stuff on your credit card and it makes your score go down and it puts you into a different category. This could lead your loan to be rejected. This means that your loan could fall through and you could lose out on this house that you have just offered on and the offer has been accepted. Don't make big purchases on your credit card before you close. Also, don't make big purchases right after you close because buying a house is not a cheap process. Even if you are getting a 100% down loan, you know, even if you don't put 20% down and you're getting a 100% fully covered loan from the bank, you don't want to go on a shopping spree right after you move in because it can cause you to go house broke. Um, you want to make sure you're smart. Like I said, you don't want to have this really cute house that you love, but you literally can't buy groceries or do anything fun. Make sure you're smart about it. As much as you want to cutesy up your house and you're like, oh, but HGTV or whatever, uh, I want to do all of this stuff to my house. You need to make sure that you are giving yourself actual money to live on, like paying bills, buying groceries, whatever. Make sure you're not wiping out your entire savings or maxing out your credit card just to make your house pretty. And also make sure you're not doing this in between when your offer is accepted and when you are actually closing on your house because it can actually ruin your chances of being cleared to close. I hope this is all making sense. Overall, I would just suggest doing your own research. Our real estate agent was Thomas's cousin's wife, so she had our best interest in mind. Of course, real estate agents get a cut of your house purchase. So a lot of times, especially in a seller's market, they don't have your best interest in mind. Um, and the same can be said for a mortgage loan officer. They seem nice and who we used was really great. But my mom, luckily, um, she's a mortgage loan officer. Or she isn't right now, but she used to be. And she used to be an underwriter. So she um, was able to like help us out throughout that process, give us tips. And because of the two of them, we were able to very logically sit down and get ready to purchase this house and make sure we weren't doing anything stupid, like buying a bunch of furniture. And that's not even stupid. It's just what people don't tell you. It's not like our mortgage loan officer was like, okay, so I'm approving you for this much, but make sure you don't go buy furniture. They're not gonna give you that tip. Make sure that you are doing your own research, whether that's looking it up online or talking to somebody that you know personally or both, you know? And if you can use a real estate agent that you know personally before you actually go into business with them in looking for a house and buying a house, that's really beneficial to in a seller's market. I know this is not attainable for everybody. I'm just giving my recommendations based on my experience because I know my experience in comparison to others who have bought houses with real estate agents that they didn't know before. And I've seen the difference in how the operation works. Our real estate agent always was honest with us. She would even tell us, she was like, this house sucks. You guys can't get this house because there's this wrong with it, this wrong with it, this wrong with it. It's, it's way overpriced, whatever. Other real estate agents will try to convince you because remember, they're like salespeople. They want you to buy so they will make a sale so they will make money. It's all about money for everybody. And so you wanna make sure that you're doing your own research. If you don't have access to people in your personal life that do this kind of stuff, do your own research online because you can find pretty much everything there. I did that before as well as talking to my real estate agent and my mom about, you know, what our concerns were, what I specifically wanted in a house and what I was scared of in the house buying process. And that was really, really helpful. So like I said a bajillion times in this video, you just need to be smart because you need to remember that this is a business transaction. Like I said, this is business. Um, yes, a house is a personal thing, but it doesn't really become personal until you're in closing, pretty much. When you are sitting at that closing table, signing papers, then you can start being like, oh my gosh, we just got a house. You can be a little celebratory before then, but make sure you're staying level-headed and smart because it can be really disappointing if you miss out on a house because you made unwise decisions or whatever, or you, you know, waived certain contingency clauses that are there for your benefit. You just need to be smart. That's the main thing, be smart. Make sure you're doing your research. 
I hope that these tips were helpful for you. I hope that my experience was somehow beneficial to you guys' viewers. The housing market is insane right now. Inflation is through the roof on everything. And it's impossible to keep up because income hasn't really increased, but the housing market has, like the average price for a house. So it's crazy, but I hope that my tips and tricks were helpful to you. I hope that explaining my experience was helpful to you as well, being a first time home buyer or something like that. Just make sure, you know, stay level-headed, stay smart. I hope that you can use my notes that I'm putting in the description box below as sort of a helpful guide from somebody else who was in your position a year ago. Um, yeah, I'm really excited that I got to make this video and I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure you give it a thumbs up and hit that notification bell down below and also subscribe to my channel if you're not already. I'd love for you to stick around if this is the first time you're seeing me. Um, I do a lot of vlogging, uh, some beauty. I do a variety of different things. This is just the first time that I've done a true house market video. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd love for you to stick around if you would like. And so yeah, that is it for now, but I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.